what is computational mathematics and how is that related to data science? Yeah, uh, computational mathematics is my big love after my husband and my son <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and my, my dogs. Um, so I, all, I was always fascinated when I was, uh, when I was a kid and then later as a student on how I can use mathematics to better understand the world around me and particularly physical processes. Uh, I, I was a huge, huge fan of fluid, fluid dynamics uh, ever since I was a kid. How do sea currents flow? What drives them? Can we predict them? What about air flows? What happens underneath the ground? You name it. You know, I wanted to understand and explain. Now, in computational mathematics, we do that translation and we allow that exploration. So think about, for, for me anyway, this is, this is a, well, just one side of computational mathematics. It's simulation. Uh, and in simulation, what we do is we take what we know to be the laws governing a, a physical phenomenon, like, for example, a flow, and we translate that on in, into a computer code that we can then use to build a virtual laboratory of that same process. Um, so computational, because we're doing... <laughs> tons and tons of computations, you know, we're working on the computer um, and, and mathematics because that translation step requires, uh, you know, a lot of mathematical tools. Um, the field of numerical analysis comes in, the field of linear algebra comes in. And then, of course, uh, once we've done the translation, you become... Uh, both a data scientist and a uh, computer scientist. A computer scientist, because you have to run those models, and those models can be very large. Uh, we ran models, for example, of Monterey Bay. Monterey Bay is a is a large bay in uh, in uh, California, and to run a model that can really help predict relatively small scale flow phenomena, we needed to run for weeks and weeks on end on a very, very large computer. So obviously you need to be a pretty decent coder because if you're not a very experienced coder, then the programs that you're running will not be very efficient. So computer science comes in. You need to understand the systems on which you're running it as well. And then data comes in uh, for two reasons. One is a lot of these models are really data-driven, meaning that you need data in order to run the models. Think about simulating a part of the ocean. Well, when you simulate a part of the ocean, clearly you're creating boundaries. You cut the ocean off somewhere. And of course, you need to understand what's happening at these boundaries to drive your model. Otherwise, nothing interesting will happen. So there's a lot of data there. You need data to validate uh, your code as well. And then uh, you generate a lot of data. So I always say that I came into data science uh, not so much because I was using tons and tons of data to help drive my models data came in for sure, but because I was producing, <laughs> I don't know how many bytes, you know, whether I should uh, think about terabytes or, or, or petabytes or even more um, of data in the simulation itself. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So when in computational mathematics, uh, what other kinds of, I mean, maybe it would help me kind of understand the area, if you also explain some applications other than like fluid dynamics, but let's stick with the fluid dynamics um, application for a moment so I can kind of say back to you my understanding of what computational math means. So with fluid dynamics, you want to be modeling how some fluid is flowing. And I think that could mean not just liquids, but like air system, like like how oh, yeah. the air yeah, can be yeah. too. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything that flows. In fact, uh, you know, of course, computational mathematics is used a lot for solid mechanics as well. Right? So for, for any substance that that may move or break or fracture, um, so you know, computational mathematics plays a massive role in, in earthquake uh, dynamics, for example, mm. earthquake prediction modeling. Um, but, but, but computational mathematics is used to, to help understand any physical process and also engineering processes and also human decisions. Here's another example. Computational mathematics is used to simulate the stock market. 
to help mm. predict the stock market, when to buy, when to sell, what sort of put you know put options to put on, you name it. So that's that's uh, they sometimes call people like that quants that are you looking at at uh, financial. Um, you know, quantitative finance, and those are also computational mathematicians. There's a lot of math behind it. There are computational mathematicians looking at behavior of people. So behavioral analysis, anything that is done in the world that uh, in which you're using mathematics to translate or uh, describe uh, a behavior, a system, um, computational mathematics comes in. There are models where people just say, here are the beautiful mathematical equations that you can use uh, to represent this phenomenon. And then they leave it at that and they start analyzing just the the pure mathematics. And they do not try to put that then on a computer. But as soon as you start putting it on a computer and you're using the computer to help gain more insights, to optimize, to simulate, uh, to predict. Uh, and that's done through a, co- a code, a computer code. It becomes computational mathematics. And then everything you do to prepare for that is also under computational mathematics. So the translation of the physics to the math, of the math to the computer code, and every single step in that last process as well. You know how you how you do the translation from mathematics to computer code, um, and uh, and then how you implement it on the computer. We all see that uh, to be part of computational mathematics. In fact, computational mathematics claims a lot because I would say that computational mathematics or computational science and engineering, as some people like to refer to it as well, uh, includes data science includes AI. Because in data science and AI, we're doing exactly that, right? We're we're interested in solving a problem. We're interested in predicting something out. We're interested in making a decision. And we're using computer algorithms in order to help us in this. Well, that's computational mathematics. There's always a ton of mathematics behind that. Yeah. So it sounds like, like I was kind of trying to think of computational mathematics as something relatively constrained where I was trying to think about like, okay, like maybe this is a field where like that idea of translation is something that's obviously very important. You mentioned that several times where this idea of translating mathematical equations, maybe of physical processes or behavioral processes into computer code. And then it sounds like something very frequently in computational mathematics is that you can end up generating a ton of data. Yes, yes, we do. In fact, there is a treasure trove out there, John, of data. Um, we you know there, there's a treasure trove of data that was observed, you know, has been observed over the past and has never been looked at. So that's the interesting part of it. And sometimes colleagues discover and then gain more insights from it. I remember one of my colleagues at Stanford finding these old aerial photographs of Antarctica and and now having the digital tools to really look at them and, and digest them. But there is this enormous treasure trove of data that has been generated over the last decades by computational mathematics that we haven't looked at yet. And I've uh, certainly put some of that data in in that treasure trove. I mentioned earlier Monterey Bay and the simulations. Well, these simulations really generate four-dimensional data, three dimensions in space, one dimensions in time. And by at the time we generated this, and this is now nearly 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I think, we did not have the data analysis tools, nor the compute power or the memory to easily get into the data, get our hands dirty, so to say, and really understand what the data was telling us. So use the data to actually visualize what was happening. So we would look at the data just in slices to say, hey, let's Let's put a vertical slice in this Monterey Bay and look at what's happening in that slice or horizontal slice. But all that data is still there to be explored. And I'm sure there are many, many things that we could discover now if we went back and and looked at this. The same with the 
I don't know how many bytes produced by companies like Boeing or by institutes like NASA or national laboratories that are sitting there in, in massive memory storage systems and have never really been fully uh, assessed. But now with data mining tools, data analysis tools, we could. So it's kind of exciting when you think it's like, wow, there's all this unexplored it's like a, a frontier that we <laughs> that we can still go and explore.